Um, so welcome to the second um, lecture or webinar from uh, of Uniscape. Um, and when we when we started uh, this uh, webinar series, we had also the idea that this could kind of uh, link up or introduce ourselves um, and to discuss topics related with that, with landscape and the European Landscape Convention, because we uh, normally would have had our physical conference in November. Sorry, in October 2020, but that has postponed to 21. So we see this kind of lecture series now as a, a bridge between last year 2020 and uh, the next one in 21. So every session is built up in, let's say, two parts. Uh, we first have a speaker that we um, that uh, well they they uh, were, they submitted an abstract uh, for this uh, for this uh, series, and so I think we have a very nice collection of uh, different speakers. Uh, today, Claire will give us uh, our, uh, her talk. And then the second part is that we have a respondent. And that is uh, normally also someone that you would see with the camera. And that's Dr. Shabnam Inanlodailu. And I hope I pronounce it well. Yes, voila. Um, and so she will respond on the, on the talk and the paper that Claire is, uh, is presenting. And then afterwards, the floor is open to the audience. And then you, each of you can ask questions by uh, typing the questions in the chat or uh, putting on your microphone and your camera to make it um, a bit more lively so that we can uh, um, actively engage with each other and with uh, the, the talk of uh, Claire and the discussion or the respondents of uh, Shatnam. Now, I also see that Tessa is back. So, Tessa, I don't know if you want to add something. Yes, I am back. Sorry for the, the glitch. And uh, just to give our warmest uh, welcome to all the attendants uh, from uh, Uniscape. I am Tessa Matteini. I am director of Uniscape. And uh, also a uh, special thanks to Claire Nolan uh, for her uh, lecture, to Shabna Nina Lo Dai Lo. And... Uh, I hope you will enjoy this, uh, this lecture and uh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, then I just uh, propose that we don't lose too much time and Clara would suggest that you uh, start presenting and then we can uh, continue afterwards. Yeah, I agree. Yep. Okay, that sounds great. <laughs> uh, just, just before we start, I just, while I am talking about um, landscapes in in the UK today, I'm actually presenting from Canada. Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm presenting from uh, the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, um, Anishinaabeg and the neutral First Nations and um, to acknowledge their how they've shaped the meaning and character of the landscape that I live in, which <laughs> to to look at it superficially, you would say that there it's just deep suburbia here, but actually there is thousands of years of, of indigenous history beneath my feet. And uh, while I'm saying that, I'm, I would just kind of like to invite the attendants to um, sort of feel their own feet on their landscape and their ground and to sort of think about maybe the heritage of that landscape if you haven't already, um, and to think of the influences of the pe past peoples and how that maybe feeds into your um, relationship with your landscape today. And you can take that awareness with you as we go along into the lecture. So I'll just share my screen with you now, I can. Okay. So yes, landscape is a common good. Um, so I, um, I wanted to sort of talk first about landscape knowledge, which directly relates to what I've just spoken about in a way, because landscape knowledge is, uh, as a set out in the uh, European Landscape Convention, is one of the most fundamental parts of understanding and developing landscapes um, and taking care of them. And so uh, a big part of that is the social value of landscape, understanding that part of landscape knowledge. Uh, to understand how we value landscape. And uh, so one of the, this has come up quite uh, in, in a big way, it, really in the last 10 to 15 years, particularly in the last five years in, um, in terms of in the heritage sector, particularly in the UK, but also in other countries. And of course, all of this work is relevant to landscape everywhere. Um, so 
some of the texts I'll just uh, refer to quickly here that the reason I've brought these ones up, there's been a wealth of literature on heritage and well-being and landscape and well-being, um, historic environment and well-being. But these uh, these four texts sort of uh, bring together a lot of the work that's been done and, and sort of uh, summarize it and give you an overview. Um, and uh, one area, so one of the, some of the work done by the well-being and historic environment report from Historic England looked at the different ways, it kind of had a stab at looking at how the different ways and routes that heritage or uh, the historic environment supports well-being. Um, so volunteering, visiting sites, um, coming together around heritage as a common interest. So uh, whether that be conservation work or uh, engaging in community archaeology um, or walks in, in historic landscapes. Um, and uh, uh, some of the main benefits that we can see are around um, social networks, the development of social networks, because heritage brings people together, they meet new people, uh, it, it, it helps people to develop new skills um, in terms of conservation and excavation. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, I suppose these are the, the transactional benefits, but also there's the emotional side, which seems to uh, play a big part in, in, in how the historic environment and how heritage assets directly impact us. Um, and, and although there's, we know a certain amount of this, and uh, certainly we, we link it to things like meaning making and belonging and sense of place, um, we're still learning about it. We're still trying to understand what that direct impact is um, and, and what it's based upon. So this was uh, what I wanted to understand more. Um, and I, in order to help me to do that, I, uh, I looked into intrinsic values. So this, uh, this is just an example of how um, from Erica Ander, who is a, a, a her team worked on um, the power of museum heritage objects to uh, induce healing for people. Um, and they said that culture and heritage do influence well-being, but not in the conventional sort of way um, that you, can, you can't necessarily measure it exactly with conventional means. Um, and, and so, yeah, this, I was kind of trying to chase this and find out, well, what is the, what is the special effect that heritage has? So intrinsic value was, was my first uh, kind of avenue. Um, and as you can see here, this is the definition that uh, Robert Hewson and John Holden, uh, heritage practitioners use. And they talk about it being the kind of direct experience of heritage intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. Um, and, and also you could add to this, uh, the number of scholars in the past few years, especially around the cultural value project, uh, which was done in the UK a number of years ago, um, talk about the the kind of the felt meaning that comes with heritage. So you could, I argue, you could add in um, not only uh, intellectual, emotional and spiritual, but also uh, the embodied felt sense and experience of heritage. Um, and I decided to apply this uh, through qualitative research to sites, uh, prehistoric sites specifically in um, the southwest of England here, as you can see. Um, so the, I suppose the one everyone knows the best is Stonehenge, as you can see it here in the middle. Um, to the north of Stonehenge is um, the landscape of Avebury and at the center of, well, the modern focal point of Avebury really is Avebury Henge, which you can see here on the right hand side. Um, and there's a village right inside the middle of it. So it's absolutely enormous. Um, uh, and to the left, we have Mardenhenge, which is roughly about equidistant between uh, Stonehenge and Avebury. Uh, again, these are just the focal points of larger landscapes. And these, uh, these monuments, these circular, subcircular, uh, ditched and banked enclosures are, well, uh, Marden and Avebury are, are actually henges, henges characterized by an internal ditch and an external bank um, thought to be uh, ceremonial or ritual and purpose. Um, Stonehenge is more like a 
prototype to a hinge. Uh, other people can correct me on this, but it, it sort of lends its name to hinge monuments. Anyway, <laughs> moving on, they are not just the center. They are they are not the center of these landscapes in a sense. They because these landscapes are huge. If you can look at, um, you can make out Stonehenge in the middle of this map. Um, you can see that there are hundreds of monuments, all from different periods uh, within the prehistoric period. So uh, essentially you're talking from the Mesolithic period around 8,000 BC into all the way through the Neolithic, the Bronze Age, into the Iron Age, which starts around 800 BC and, and ends about 550 AD um, and uh, you can see some of these monuments here so we have Durrington Walls which is another henge enclosure on the left hand side uh, we have the timber uh, setting circular timber setting at Woodhenge in the center uh, a Bronze Age round barrow here on the right hand side um, which uh, may have been a burial uh, mound in some cases they don't contain burials and uh, to the bottom left, we have Stonehenge and the avenue leading to Stonehenge. Um, so it, immediately Stonehenge broadens once you get onto the avenue and then you start to link with other monuments. Um, uh, at the bottom here in the middle, we have uh, Blickmead, which was, it's a recently excavated Mesolithic occupation site. Um, and, uh, and then we have the uh, greater Cursus in the Stonehenge landscape here. Um, rectilinear, linear, ditched and banked uh, enclosure, which purpose, uh, we're, we're not too sure. I think there are lots of different understandings of it. Perhaps it's a boundary, perhaps it's uh, to do with um, uh, marking uh, pathways in the landscape, earlier pathways. Um, so here we have then the Avebury landscape and you see the same thing again, it, that the Avebury Henge is just one large monument at the centre of um, hundreds of monuments and, uh, and not just monuments, but uh, we're talking about there's unexcavated remains, of course, and there's um, uh, um, agricultural field systems dating to the Bronze Age. Um, and also um, you have with I know with the Marlborough Downs, which are just to, that surround the Avery landscape, um, there have been finds from the Paleolithic period. So you're going back 600,000 years um, of, of history or prehistory in this place. Um, here are again, some, some of the monuments. I won't spend too long uh, on these because we don't have a whole lot of time. So, um, but you can look them up again. And then we have in between the Avery and Stonehenge landscapes, which are actually part of the same World Heritage Site, but they're separated by about 40 kilometers. Uh, you can see Marden Henge there with a the river uh, in the middle. Um, now Marden, or the Vale of Pusey is slightly different to Avebury and Stonehenge in that it's uh, situated on uh, green sand, whereas Avebury and Stonehenge are on uh, chalk uplands so the survival for monuments on, on the uplands is much better. Um, monuments in the Vale of Pusey didn't survive so well, um, the exception to that being Mardenhenge, um, which it, even, even at that is quite eroded anyway. Um, and then, but what you do have, if you can see, you can make out the Marlborough Downs, the sort of southern edge or of or what you could describe as the northern escarpment of the Vale of Pusey um, has some monuments in that which have survived quite well. Uh, and you can see them here. Um, you have Adam's Grave Long Barrow there on the, on the top left, which is about, uh, I suppose, roughly dates to about 3600 BC. And then we have some Iron Age monuments uh, on the bottom here. Um, Oh, uh, on the left of the Giant's Grave, which is an Iron Age promontory fort. Um, and then actually to the right is, is a Neolithic monument, uh, Knapp Hill Causeway enclosure, which was a circular enclosure, uh, possibly a gathering place and, and ritual site as well. So you can, if I go back, you can sort of imagine 
I'm trying to give you the best picture I can without bringing you to this place that uh, as you wander around this area, if you drive through the landscape, there are monuments everywhere. There are reminders of heritage everywhere and not just prehistoric heritage. Um, I focused on prehistoric heritage because I've, at the time I felt we, we needed to understand more how people perceive it, um, what social value it has. Um, and uh, but that aside, these these landscapes are, you know, they've been continuously inhabited up until the present day. Um, but you can't help but notice that there are remains everywhere and it's sort of, uh, it's, yeah, I wanted to know, uh, particularly for people who live in these places, what, what do these places mean to them? If they pass them on a daily basis on their way to work, do they take them in at all? Do they take them for granted? Um, those sorts of questions, because I think the danger, as Baz Padroli mentioned last month in um, his Uniscape lecture, is that there's an unconsciousness, there's a lack of awareness around landscape for some people. Um, and that goes for the historic environment as well. Um, so um, I decided to uh, interview local people within these areas. Um, and I also, so I did a number of interviews. I did 33 interviews and that was with uh, 40 participants, seven of, of which were uh, joint interviews with couples. Um, and I also did some, uh, a series of uh, kind of mindful walks in the Avebury landscape with three different groups, uh, two groups of students and one group of local people. Um, and uh, part of, I suppose this is really where, as we're talking about where the disciplines meet within landscape, this is where the disciplines met within this project, uh, because I drew a lot on the phenomenological um, theory and practice from not only landscape phenomenology, which is used was used in archaeology to think differently about prehistoric monuments, uh, and that's really about getting a feel for the landscape and noticing the relationship between monuments, between different parts of the landscape with the monuments, um, but also drew on a phenomenological practice in um, uh, non-representational uh, theory, which is, uh, comes from human geography, um, and also mindfulness-based cognitive therapy from psychology. And I also used um, experiential psychotherapy, so focusing-oriented psychotherapy. Uh, and all of that really boils down to looking at people's lived experience. Uh, so not only including their intellectual uh, perception of places, the visual, but also their felt experience and really looking at how these places impact people personally. Um, in the case of uh, local people was looking at their everyday experience of, of these monuments and, and the archeology span in the area. But uh, then taking with the groups, uh, Two of those groups were were not local to the area. They were visitors, um, and uh, one was local. But it was to look at their physical experience as well. Uh, well, all of it, but really getting them to be immersed in the landscape um, and to to just really focus on the archaeology itself uh, and and their what how they responded to it. Um, so some of the methods that I I used for that were. Um, it, prior to the interviews, I invited um, uh, participants to keep some form of reflective account about the place that they live in, whether that was photographic or written, um, it could have been pictorial, people could do whatever they wanted. Um, so some people did, did do that. Um, this would have been these, if you look here on the left, sorry, the top um, piece of writing here and, and the bit on the left. These were some of the ideas that I, I sent to people in preparation. Uh, really, I wanted their personal experience, but I, I, I thought that in case people, uh, because I was dealing with a range of different people from uh, different backgrounds and different educational backgrounds, uh, I thought it might be better to have some prompts just in case to give people some ideas about maybe what they could uh, focus on for their reflective account. Um, and the same for the bottom right piece of writing here was uh, what I gave to people going into the field it, for our mindful walks to reflect upon. Um, 
And these were kind of drawn together uh, from all these different phenomenological um, uh, disciplines uh, that I was uh, uh, talking about earlier um, to, to yeah, really get people to um, get beneath the, the, the habitus, if that's even possible. But it, in, in some realms, some of the non-representational uh, scholars will say that it's not possible um, once you bring words into the equation, once you try to describe something. However, if you look at um, focusing-oriented psychotherapy, um, Eugene Gendlin, the man who created this form of therapy, feels that if you that you can describe it, even if it's an image or a sense, um, you can. You don't have to name it as an emotion necessarily, but you can start to uh, connect with some kind of a sensation or a, a, some personal understanding. So this is what I was working on, hoping that I could uh, get a bit deeper with my uh, my interview questions and uh, with the walks that we did. Um, oh, and also with the walks we had at the end um, some. Um, uh, um, sorry, um, uh, uh, interview, like a group interview um, conversation, which was recorded. And you will see, at, if some of you arrived earlier, um, you will have seen a, a piece of film, which may have been confusing to some of you, but uh, that's actually um, what one of the group participants did. She took a, a head cam with her on the walk um, and then she, with permission from all the other participants in her group, uh, took the field recordings from our, our group interview and, and kind of put them over top the video. So uh, with that video, you, want, you get a sense of the kind of things we were talking about and, and, and how the landscape was perceived for, for that particular participant. Um, so here, yeah, you have some of the photos uh, that some residents have taken of their local area uh, and of monuments that are significant to them. Uh, and the same then back to the visitor perspectives, some of the students took photos as well. Um, and really uh, on an analyzing all of this material, uh, I picked out the main themes that I could see in terms of understanding how people, I was looking at valued affect meaning emotion, how those sorts of the positives that people highlighted in relation to their experience. Um, and these centered around uh, security, collective connections and possibility. And by security, uh, I talk about the, the physical nature, the form of the landscape, the monuments in the landscape rather, um, and, and what, that, what that feels like for people. Um, again, the age, it was another, the sense of the age of these places has, has an enormous impact on people. And then the narratives of them and what, what people make of those narratives and how they relate them to the, their own experience and identity. Um, with collective connections, um, really was the connectivity people felt with past people, with um, the, the a, a very much humankind, humanity was the kind of um, a big focus people didn't uh, talk about. When I, I put in here ancestral reverence, uh, and I don't mean direct ancestry here, I mean, and I don't mean this connection, not in an indigenous way, but more connection with past people. Um, and really this feeling part of something greater than, than oneself. Um, uh, and possibility was how these places uh, open up people's minds, they open up perspective, help people gain perspective on their lives through uh, thinking about time differently or uh, imagining what the landscape could have looked like before and how that changes the meaning of people's landscapes and, and makes it new and exciting. Um, but one of the biggest areas of, uh, here, uh, biggest themes was how people use these places as, as spaces to contemplate problems, to get away from their crazy modern lives and to think about, think out problems to people went there when they had bereavements, um, difficult life issues. And, and for many of them, it helped them to manage these, these uh, difficult emotions and to get through difficult times. So I'll just go into some of the, uh, um, the quotes that people 
um, that I've taken from the interviews and um, the group interviews as well. Um, so the first one here, I, I won't go into each in detail, but um, yeah, the first here, a sense of security. So the, the person who was talking about this uh, Iron Age enclosure, that he feels secure within within the the, um, the walls of this um, uh, Iron Age earthwork. And uh, uh, part of that was just the sheer size of it. Um, but also I think, um, as I'll talk about in a minute, about the permanence of, and the how long this, this uh, monument has been in the landscape. Um, another... Um, area was the peacefulness and um, the contentment and uh, comfort a lot of people experience. So here this lady was talking about how it feels to be uh, at Stonehenge, but others uh, had these feelings um, in, in, in Avebury and in Iron Age monuments, not just Henge monuments. Um, that can be often associated with spirituality. It was, yeah, it was it, even in, in settlement sites where there's field systems. Um, and uh, so for some people, it was the stillness of, of the sites. For some, it's in being in touch with the past. For some, some people said, especially around the Stonehenge area, that it was a feeling in the landscape. And, and this, I, I think, needs a bit more um, research actually. I, I noticed that Tim Sykes is here and I do wonder if it's something to do with the um, um, the aquifer uh, in the area possibly. But anyway, so the um, the the uh, another big one was this the permanence, the, the stability that these these monuments have been here for so long. Um, and that's calming for people. It, it's grounding for them to know that things continue on and um, and also that they are part of something bigger as one this person says here you only you realize you're only a small speck at the end of the day and it, it kind of just calms everyone down <laughs> to think of that uh, so real existential themes um, and um, and then in terms of uh, yeah the past again the, the middle one there about putting three or four thousand years between yourself and those immediate worries in the present I think people there's for many people there's a sense of time traveling that the past is kind of a refuge to get away from the modern world um at the bottom uh this man talks about feeling part of the journey of the landscape and, and feeling a part of the physical landscape um others uh felt it's it, it, it again reminded them that, that they were um it's it's their human identity and uh that this is the story of humanity when you look at these sites. Um, for others, they identified with some of the narratives that they uh, perceived to be there. For some, that was uh, a lot, was, there was a spiritual connection for people where they felt that ritual had gone on in these places and that they, um, they valued ritual and that was a part of their identity. And so the monuments support that aspect of their identity and re, re, reinforce it. Um, here with the collective connections. Um, it, uh, yeah, there was this uh, recurring theme of how the direct connection, almost when you touch a stone, you're touching people of the past and, um, and how meaningful that is for people. Um, and, uh, and with the second quote here, um, uh, this man talks about feeling contained by the physicality, the physical nature of the monuments, but also contained by the fact that people have been in this landscape for a long, long time. So even though they're not there anymore, they there's a presence of these people there still. Um, and I think that that's comforting for a lot of people. Um, and and also it's, I suppose, in a local sense of localness, um, This the third quote here, a man talks about feeling part of a connected community. Um, some people said that they felt like they were tenants in, in this landscape that had gone on for thousands of years. They were just the next tenants that needed to take care of this landscape. Um, and they felt connected to the past tenants of, of the landscape. So that is, is comforting for people as well. Um, and in the same respect, uh, some people felt uh, often people would talk about uh, standing stones and different monuments in, in a personification sort of way that they almost like people, that they're like members of the community um, and, and people felt, feel held by that. Um, so 
yeah, all of this was about feeling part of something bigger. And uh, the same with people would talk about the um, in the in the way that Stonehenge is, is maybe a marker of um, astronomical events. People felt connected to the wider cosmos through that um, narrative as well. Um, and then back to possibility. So the, the top quote here is a lady who talks about how she you know, she visualizes how the landscape must have looked in the past and um, and how it's exciting for her. And that was very common for people. Um, and for uh, people who had, uh, with the second quote, this is uh, some people who had not been interested in, in prehistory and had found um, an artifact on their land. And through that, they became much more engaged in the, um, uh, the prehistoric heritage of the, of the landscape. Um, and through that, it started to get them to think differently, to think about their world differently, to question more. Um, and they were they were vitalized by this. Um, then in terms of possibility in, in relation to um, these places as liminal places that, um, as you can see, the picture of the uh, West Canada Avenue here. And often people felt that they were being guided or that this, this as you walk through these stones that something's happening to you something's changing that the pathway through the landscape um, is transformative for people uh, the same when people go into uh, stone circles where they feel there's a sense of timelessness um, and uh, 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 and that then contributes I think to um, as is exemplified here at the bottom um, by how why people go to these places to to think out problems there um, as I've suggested in an earlier paper and I know Jonathan last has talked about uh, heritage being a heterotopic space that we can sort of uh, we're in the world but not quite in the world and we sort of get away from our real life and to go and, and meditate and to contemplate um, so with all of these, again, as you can see, quite existential themes that it's something you think that we can all relate to. And I think, although this is um, largely based on prehistoric archaeology, I think you can um, you can attribute some of these kinds of uh, experiences to more recent heritage as well. Um, but yeah, you would think that this contributes to a common good, or at least the, it has the potential to contribute to a common good. Um, however, there were contrasting views as well, and um, some not so not so harsh. The, the first one here, actually, this is probably the only person in the whole 66 people that I spoke to who really just wasn't interested in heritage um, and old stuff. Um, and she said she, she she later contradicted slightly, kind of said, yeah, I'm interested in what what's that lump in the field beside me. But she really wasn't that bothered. And so we didn't get a deeper experience from our conversation so much. Um, for some people, particularly with uh, Mardenhenge, because it's it's so difficult to see and it's uh, so eroded. Um, people don't really and because it's so large people don't actually know what they're standing inside of and they they kind of take it for granted and it's not that dramatic in comparison to say Stonehenge so um, uh, yeah people there's some people who, I mean at the same time all of these people who who picked out negative aspects of the, of the archaeology um, except the lady at the, at the beginning, uh, all had positive experiences from monuments as well. Um, but uh, just, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the, the one I want to highlight here is really, as we all know, that Stonehenge is quite a contested landscape. Um, and some people I spoke to just said that really the, the tourism and the traffic and everything that had built up around uh, Stonehenge had just soured their view of it and their relationship to it to the degree that they don't even bother to go go there anymore. Um, for, and for one man here, he said that just the sound of the traffic that uh, it creates it actually makes him depressed. And so there's a kind of a, a trade off here because you're thinking, hang on a minute. On one level, uh, this this uh, the historic environment is uh, contributes to well-being, but there are times when it doesn't and when it's actually negatively impacting people um and and i think that's a very difficult balance uh, there's a difficult place to be in um 
because uh, uh, yeah, some people felt that they were just uh, um, kind of that they Stonehenge didn't belong to them anymore, and they were dispossessed and. Um, and it's a shame when we've gotten to that stage. Um, so, um, yeah, so, but however, a lot of these uh, feelings were, yeah, they were conflicted. I think that's the main thing. It's at, at the, If you look at the bottom quote here, this lady says, it's not Stonehenge itself that's negative. It's just the things that have been done in its name. And, uh, and that's something that we really need to reflect upon and think about that. How we manage our sites and and, and uh, how people how we communicate them to the public. Um, but uh, if I come back to the top here, so the lady who said this had said earlier, ah, oh, not really that bothered about monuments in my area. And yet, the the more we talked, it seemed that actually she she found uh, it kind of they being around, we'll say the um, monuments at Avebury helped her to reflect on her mortality and to think about, well, we're only here for a short time and gosh, you know, uh, we better make the most of it. And that is, that feeds into that idea of possibility that, um, you know, that it, it gives us perspective on our lives that, so that we can move forward with purpose and we can do new things. Um, and with the second uh, quote here, this lady again, she was actually the woman who talked about uh, she has a monument on her land that's uh, been quite restrictive in terms of being able to farm it uh, to the degree that it has really, really upset her. But at the same time, she respects this uh, piece of land. Well, she says she doesn't see it as a piece of land anymore. She sees it as special. And it's. she says it's beholden to her to keep it special. Um, and and that suggests that there's there's a there's something else. There's some other positive impact happening and I, I think again uh, what go, what Baz mentioned last month about how um, how landscape impacts us uh, unconsciously um, so it's worth reflecting on these things um, it's worth going that bit deeper just to see how do I really feel about this? You know, I walk by this wall or this monument on a daily basis. I don't really take it in. Well, actually, when I stop to think about it, what do I think of it? How does it make me feel? How do I interact with it? And how does it shape my life on a daily basis? Um, so you can see here some of the comments on how the exercises I did with people uh, did have value because it made them have those thoughts for the first time. For some people, the first time they ever thought about these things. Um, for some people who had a relationship, already had a good relationship with their landscape, uh, with the archaeology and the landscape, uh, by, by doing some of the exercises on the mindful walks, they started to see their landscape differently and appreciate it even more. Um, that was actually quite a common one. A number of participants came back to me later on and said, thank you, because it's really helped me value my landscape even more and, uh, you know, and enjoy it even more. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think, and the same, the, the last um, quote there, one of the students said that, that they found that it really, yeah, it really helped them to engage with the archaeology. And I think this is um, part of the issues we're having around trying to establish the direct impact of um, archaeology on our heritage on well-being is that um, with a lot of quantitative um, approaches, we're not necessarily directing it right at the resource itself, at the um, archaeology itself. And it's to understand what that intimate relationship is between the person and their environment. Um, so just to sort of contextualize this a little bit. Um, so uh, landscape philosopher Laura Manati has uh, suggested that a common philosophical ground is required for the definition of landscape an interdisciplinary and integrative discussion able to take into account the differences of the subjects living in the landscape. Um, and she says that in order so that we can manage the ethical issues that uh, landscape presents us with on, on a day-to-day -day basis. And what I wonder is if we can, um, we can use, we could have a phenomenological ground, one that's based on reflection and immersion and embodiment, um, that would that's a common area for us all essentially human experience so um just these are just an, a more examples of um of of that going deeper 
um, into one's experience. Um, and the one here on the right um, kind of highlights what a lot of people came with. Uh, even people, who, some people didn't read any of the um, guidance I'd sent. So um, the fact that we got something out of that was great. But for those who did read it, generally the uh, interviews were richer because people had got, done that deeper reflection. Um, for this lady, we did that reflection in the interview and she couldn't, she sort of said what a lot of people said was, I, it's a feeling, but I can't, I can't describe what it is. I can't tell you what it is that, that these monuments, these landscapes give me this feeling. Um, and so we went deeper into maybe what her, her physical sensation of it was. And it wasn't what you might get in a, um, some of the, um, effective scales you have in well-being where they talk, uh, put in, they have words that describe positive experiences um, with typical emotional uh, experiences. Uh, for this lady, she just said, ah, oh, you know, it feels like you're not heavy anymore. It just feels like everything's been lifted. And that's, you know, it's something, it's, it's, it's not as easily pinpointed that kind of feeling uh, with just one word on emotion. Um, so, um, some of this has been highlighted by um, a number of people. The Cultural Value Project that was done a number of years ago, um, geographer Gareth Hoskins talked about how um, uh, in locating the value, how we ascribe value to heritage sites. Um, and he took examples of heritage preservation and listing officers from the US and UK. Um, and, and they explained how being at the sites, physically going to the sites, has a big impact on how they ascribe value to these places. It changes how they assess these sites. Um, and Hoskins emphasized how important this is and that we need to build in this more ph phenomenological approach to, um, to listing and, and preservation. Um, another example is um, anthropologist Chelsea Armstrong and Eugene Anderson from Canada. And they did work on landscapes um, in British Columbia on Gitsan First Nations landscapes where they uh, they were assessing landscape in advance of a pipeline and uh, they needed to gather more information. Some sites had been missed actually in the original assessment um, and they went out with people from the, the indigenous people of this landscape and um, went out on their daily what these people would normally do in terms of um, harvesting, hunting um, and while they were out there they talked about the archaeology together and it gave uh, not just the indigenous people, but also the uh, the archaeologists themselves and a, pre a greater appreciation of the relationship between the archaeology and the landscape. Um, so I think these approaches are a fundamental part of developing landscape knowledge of placemaking and the well-being that they create. Um, and um, just looking at the work of uh, another anthropologist Jay Johnson from um, the United States, he, he quotes the work of geographer Pierce Lewis, and he refers to the idea that our landscape is our unwitting autobiography and suggests that if this is the case, we would benefit from being more curious about our surroundings. Uh, Johnson suggests that placemaking um, is a common response to common curiosities like what happened here, who was involved, what was it like, why should it matter? Um, and and this is kind of relating back to what I've been talking about in, in my project that, you know, I feel it's not just about educating people about heritage and landscape, um, but it's, it's about um, cultivating a deeper form of engagement that includes mindful and embodied approaches to cultural heritage man management and landscape management in general. Um, if we can if we can walk in each other's footsteps and uh, shoes in the landscape, listen to each other, feel or reflect. Um, you know, if we could somehow have uh, planners going out and shadowing local people um, and uh, being participant observants in their day to day life in that landscape, um, heritage professionals, researchers, we all need to be uh, going deeper, I think, and, and having these kinds of conversations. Um, and I wonder if this would help to reform existing landscape partnerships to make them more uh, mindful and more conscious. Um, and this might help us to appreciate the multidimensional nature of landscape and to, um, to use um, different disciplines to, to, to maximize the potential of our landscape. Um, 
So I suppose just to sum up, um, really, um, in order to develop our understanding of social value of landscape, we need to create the space and opportunity for people to reflect more deeply on their historic environment, both recent and the longer histories of that landscape. Um, and that we, yeah, we need to integrate different disciplines. In this case, I've integrated uh, phenomenological insights from um, archaeology, geography, psychotherapy, psychology, philosophy. Um, and I feel that this has helped to understand the potential of this landscape more, how it can be for the common good. Um, so that's kind of, I'll stop there for now. I hope I haven't gone on for too long and I'll um, hand over to Shabnam. Um, Thank you, Claire, for this uh, wonderful talk and insights that you give. And um, I don't know if someone introduced uh, Shabnam already. Are you there, Shabnam? I see your... Uh... Yes, there you are. Good. Yes, I'm here. Um, so as I uh, explained in the beginning, every session there is a respondent and tonight we are very happy to, um, to have Shabnam uh, Inalu uh, in our uh, group. Uh, she's the chair of the Center of Interdisciplinary Study Studies in Achabashka Ach University, is that right, in Canada? Tabasca. Tabasca, okay, that's a... Uh, and um, I think as I told you in the beginning, it's very nice that we uh, kind of uh, uh, have you as a guest here outside outside the European network, although Claire is physically in, in Canada. Uh, but we are looking forward also to your uh, insights and your um, reflections on what Claire told us. So uh, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rarely. And uh, thank you, Claire, Tessa, uh, uh, Tommaso. And also I would like to mention Connor for, for the invitation. And it, it's a pleasure to be here actually today. Um, so I'm participating from Edmonton, Alberta in Western Canada. So I live and work on the traditional lands of indigenous peoples, the traditional land of Treaty 6 peoples here, and also the region four of the Métis Nation of Alberta. And I, I truly honor the ancestral heritage and gifts of the indigenous people and give thanks to them. Um, uh, like, it's, it's just so interesting. And I should actually uh, add here that since we are meeting online and it's such a broad regional scope here, I would also like to acknowledge all the traditional lands and territories that we are reaching out uh, and, you know, in looking forward in, like, in the spirit of conciliation and collaboration. And I, I truly appreciate your presentation, Claire, because it resonated with me, of course, you know, being in the field, you know, my interest in the cultural landscape and also like my ongoing research uh, like in Canada about cultural landscapes where people and places meet. And um, when, when you were talking, I was reminded basically uh, of three of my experiences, and I'm happy that I picked those three experiences. I don't know if I can share a screen here. I have the images of, can I, can I? Okay, that would be useful, thank you. Uh, let's see if I can share it here quickly. Can you see this image? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So I was reminded of my uh, visit to this place uh, two decades ago, basically. Uh, it's an archaeological site in Iran, a sacred Zoroastrian fire temple called Takht Soleiman, which literally means the throne of Solomon. Uh, the site has a strong symbolic and spiritual uh, significance. And I felt a strong connection to this landscape when I was there. And also as a personal note, my grandfather is from this region, but I had never visited this place before that time, almost 25 years ago. So uh, when um, the moment I reached the summit of that volcano, um, you know, in the background, which is 100 meter above the surrounding landscape, I felt even a stronger sense of belonging that has stayed with me ever since. So that's, that's an incredible experience. And I should say I had a similar experience when I first visited Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump in Alberta, again in Western Canada, a few years after that visit, 
The Buffalo Jump consists of a vast landscape and a cliff, a natural feature that has cultural significance to the indigenous peoples of the area, that's Blackfoot people. Being on the edge of this cliff that you can see here, it's a jagged escarpment uh, of the sandstone bedrock along the flanks of this hill, uh, porcupine hill. I really felt the fundamental connection of the people to this land, to the plains landscape here. So this sense of place was amazing and I was reminded of my other visit. So later on and through my conversations with, with elders, informants, and also through stories and my own research, I learned more and more about the connection between people and places, the associations, you know, with regard to this landscape, which is really critical and part of well-being of the local communities, the First Nation peoples here for centuries, if not millennia. And of course, this culture and nature interrelationship is not unique to Canada from an, from an indigenous perspective. Uh, for example, uh, in the heart of the central Australian desert, there is a majestic red sandstone formation on a land by Anangu people, the, the community, indigenous communities uh, there. So the Uluru Kota Juta uh, Park, National Park, is not only uh, famous for its jewel geological formation, but also because of the extraordinary indigenous culture, the traditional law, stories and spirituality. So when I was taking the base walk around the, the hill, I welcomed the invitation that asked visitors to, and I quote here, let the knowledge you hear come through your ears, into your mind and settle into your heart. Because as Anangu people say, life lives in the land and the people. So honestly, the walk around the rock has been quite an unforgettable experience for me that has let me connect with the land and also learn about the stories. So no matter if, if the walk was like, you know, uh, a mindful walk as a guided tour of the place, like this case in Uluru, or, uh, you know, the, the medicine walks for indigenous peoples in Canada, or non-guided walk as I took it at Tahti uh, Soleiman, they all serve the same purpose, engaging people with the landscape and making them feel better feel being part of this place. So maybe I can stop sharing here, yes. Um, so um, three historic environments, three different landscapes, three different parts of the world, um, you know, um, each landscape manifests diverse yet similar associations with the land, either tangibly or intangibly, and diverse yet connected cultural practices. So that kept me wondering about your topic, uh, Claire, that, uh, okay, there are differences, but there are so commonalities here that we can really reflect on. And based on these experiences, now I'm convinced of the, the impact of the land and the landscape, even without knowing the stories and people. And what if you know the background information? What if you relate to the local communities? Um, so um, I think that I can relieve those experiences even without being there personally, but those feelings has stayed with me ever since. And again, you know, it's obvious that cultural uh, places and historic environments directly influence people's lived experiences through self-awareness, you know, having a strong sense of belonging to a place and ability to relate to others by seeing things from different perspectives. Uh, and what I say different perspectives, so I should say that it's the first time I'm, you know, learning about UNESCO, UNESCAPE series, and I'm amazed by the topic that you have selected for this series, where the disciplines meet. So looking at my own background, coming from engineering and then switching to landscape architecture and then environmental design, working in heritage conservation field, I see that disciplines actually meet, but my training and background has sort of impacted how I see things, right? So it's more Western oriented. It comes from, uh, you know, a sort, sort of like a different perspective. And now living um, in Canada, 
I'm acknowledging every day more and more the role of the indigenous traditional knowledge and way of thinking and worldviews in how I, I understand landscape and relate to them. So that's been an eye-opening experience for me personally. And I hope that you would agree that the value of indigenous ways of knowing in cultural heritage is immeasurable. Uh, and certainly critical in inspiring a, a dialogue and deepening cross-cultural understanding. So why, why I'm mentioning all of this, and I think it's sort of like, I was listening to you, Claire, and I think I got an uh, answer to my question, but I will, I will mention it again in case you can add or elaborate on that. So, um, you know, we, we know that these places, these landscapes, environments are important to local communities for example, to indigenous peoples, that's there, you know, we know that. But um, uh, I mean, if you can tell us, you know, you, you actually talked about it, like visitors perspective, like people who are guests on the land and people who are just coming to this place for a visit, they might come back or not. How we can, you know, we can make that feeling experience long lasting and a practice that we can continue in other places. Um, I mean, how we can make it more pronounced in a way and you know, consciously doing this without, the, if you ask for example, a visitor to a place and say, what are your feelings? They would focus on that, but maybe mm -hmm. not thinking in that way. So like, I guess if you can collaborate, uh, elaborate, you know, how different cultures coming to a place think about that like uh, like in a sustainable way if it's the right way mm. to it. so I hope I, I made sense I'll, I'll try <laughs> I mean uh, I think a certain amount of this is happening uh, I know at uh, the national uh, sorry in Stonehenge um, the National Trust take visitors out on on walks in the landscape and and they are they have an experiential element to them and I've met people who've before and after sort of um they beforehand didn't really think much of stonehenge um just pile of stones in a field uh or or the, it had been hyped you know overhyped um and then following this walk which was with an archaeologist um they 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 had a much greater um i suppose sense of reverence and respect for it actually afterwards they did start to feel um, the landscape as such. Um, and uh, there's also been some work done a long, long time ago. I think there's bits and pieces. I can't, I think the name of the um, uh, the scholar was is Muscardi is the, um, the second name. Somebody else might be able to illuminate. Um, but she uh, looks at, uh, she calls mindful visitors. And the way to do this is to change how we signpost people around heritage sites um, to make it more fluid, but also to, um, to it, I think it really, it stems up getting people to ask questions of themselves. So it's not about just giving information about sites. It's about um, asking people, well, what do you think about that? And what does, and what does this feel like for you? And, you know, even if that's just on a, um, an exhibition or something, um, that it's just that slight nudge to get people to to focus inwardly for even for a few minutes or for a few seconds just to. Um, and also the work, sorry, I neglected to say, Emma Waterton, who's a heritage researcher, has done a lot of work on, on this as well. Um, she's actually the, she's really the, um, the authority in this area. And she she's actually based in Australia now and works with uh, Uluru as well. Um, but she did work in um, Northern England in a site called the Potteries, um, which was a, a kind of a, I think it was a working class area where it, literally they made uh, ceramics and ceramic factories. And uh, she's interviewed people in a more in-depth kind of way um, at these uh, sites and given them um, qualitative questionnaires where they get to elaborate more on their experience and that um I, I think she's gives a good yeah but it's back to that reflection and questioning and if there's any way we can do that um or immersing people in landscapes if that's possible um then i think that's a step in the right direction excellent thank you so much and i, I should say that i i really 
uh, appreciate your presentation and the details because we, we know it's happening and they are all there, but having evidence that others also think, because we are so much involved in the heritage field that, you know, it's part of our DNA these days, but knowing that others also have the same connection and the connectedness feeling is also very much appreciated. So I don't know, I'm just mindful of time, so I will stop there. I'm, I think questions are coming in for you, Claire. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Indeed, uh, I would like to ask uh, partici participants if you have any questions for the two or comments or reflections or similarities with your work. So you can um, just uh, raise your hand in a way. I know that you can do it in Zoom. I don't remember how, but uh, or type a question in the um, uh, in the in the chat. Uh, Connor, you have something perspective and pathos. You want to explain? Yeah, could I come in here and first of all to say I'm sorry oh. being able to be there to introduce you both, but. Uh, my thanks to Virla for stepping in. Um, I'm always interested, I think, in this question of perspective and pace of, mm -hmm. in a sense, the question of scale and the association between scale and servicing one's existential well-being, that somehow or other, as you've mentioned a couple of times, the experiences of different people you've brought around, that maybe they're stepping into an unfamiliar landscape and the unfamiliarity of it, the scale of it, both in terms of its uh, physical size, its spatial scale and its temporal scale are beyond comprehension, immediate comprehension. And so in a way they, they transport you outside your normal paths of thinking. Um, and perhaps when they're brought around by somebody like you, there's always going to be that anticipation anyway but mm -hmm. uh, I'm interested in the manner in which uh, scale and the altered perspective it creates has a way of reminding us of our common human uh, pathos. And I don't know whether I'm right or wrong there, but wearing your, uh, your hat as a psychotherapist why does that have a beneficial effect on <laughs> what is it about us as a species that we require and need and benefit from being um, kind of shaken out of our everyday complacency and familiarity in order to come to a better understanding, as uh, Shabnam was saying, of our place in the world? of who we are in the world, of our beingness in the world. Um, mm -hmm. So from the point of view of kind of psychotherapy, I agree entirely with Shabnan's comment that wouldn't it be great if we could do this always? That there's a line in a song by Van Morrison. He says this, you know, uh, he ends a song by saying, you know, it would be great if it was always like this. So somehow or other, that level of awareness, is there a way that we can achieve that? So there's two parts to that question. One is what's going on in the human psyche that requires this? And how do you think we can move from these exceptional experiences into turning them into more everyday experiences? Very easy questions. <laughs> You don't, you don't, you don't uh, beat around the bush, Connor. <laughs> uh, I, I think with the first, um, I mean, really looking at it from a existential psychotherapy point of view, I think it's a, it's, it's this need to not feel alone in the universe, kind of, um, and um, I think it's a spiritual thing. And by the, I'm not being denominational about that either. I think we we all crave something you know, deeper, um, some deep connection. And a lot of people that I spoke to talked about that, this connection to our origins that people, um, they really get a, um, you know, a sense of grounding from that, this continuity and connection. And it's almost like it's uh, a connection to the, the source or to the, you know, to the bigger question of what's it all about. 
I think it's on some level we feel maybe it can it can bring us closer to answering what that question is. I, I'm not, I don't know for sure. This is just a personal kind of assessment, really, of of what I do know. Um, but um, and then in terms of how we can bring that into our daily lives, I mean, you you know, all you have to do is go to a mindfulness class to to uh, to find that out uh, that you can. You can, we can live more mindfully in our day to day lives, even if it's just being aware of how we're brushing our teeth in the mirror, you know. Um, but in terms of how that relates to um, archaeology and the historic environment, I think, uh, like one example for me is as I, I referenced, I said earlier that I live in a very, very suburban place. And if you didn't know anything about the heritage here, you would just think it's supermarkets and um, housing states for miles and that there was no deeper meaning to, to it at all. Yet when you, you learn that actually there are indigenous longhouse villages, well, they were excavated just a few meters away from here, um, that the road outside my door, which is now a motorway, is actually an, an old Mohawk trail. Um, immediately, uh, I become more mindful and more connected to my environment and, and appreciate it more and want to know more about it, actually. Um, so I think that's that's really, like you've hit the nail on the head. I think it's the size of these places and uh, the size of time in terms of uh, deep time and temporality. But I think, um, you know, archaeology and historic environments can be, uh, act like a mnemonic to remind us to think think about these things in, in greater depth and, to, and yeah, just to remember them, even if we can't do it all the time, at least when we look out and see whatever ancient or old architecture, we can, it can trigger us back into that bigger awareness again. So um, yeah, I don't know if that's answered your question, but that's my suggestion anyway. Thank you, Claire. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> There is someone with a very long uh, comment, but I think the first one in the chat is uh, Margarita. Uh, you had a question regarding the roles of walks. Yes, hello. Yes. Hi. Thank you, thank you, Claire, for, for a very inspiring uh, talk. Um, I, so I, I'm, I really liked um, the whole of it, but also I, I picked some, um, some elements that uh, nicely connect your experience, your research to the speech I, I'll have to deliver next month on, uh, on the role of the relationship between landscape and um, mobility. So my question is, I'm sorry, I'm looking up because I have another screen now. I'm trying to move the, the window in, on the screen below because it looks quite weird otherwise okay now I'm <laughs> talking to you directly sorry uh, so my question is uh, regarding the role of, uh, of walking in in helping us going beyond the gaze towards the heritage into a more than representational relation with the with the landscape so have you encountered differences in walking and moving uh, compared to other forms of, um, of, uh, of experience. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely think walking when you're right in a landscape just helps you to, um, especially, well, especially in, in, the, in the landscapes I've been talking about, because in some of them, there are, they were walking through ceremonial avenues, um, what we think were ceremonial avenues. And um, they instruct your movement. They, they sort of give you no option other than to, to walk within this, um, you know, avenue. And that immediately structures people's experiences. Um, so I think in that respect, um, the movement uh, creates greater meaning for people. Um, in terms of uh, different landscapes, I mean, every landscape is a cultural landscape, essentially, um, because... Uh, we've interfered with in some way or another, but uh, I, I think for that, for the for that was for the let's say the um, uh, for Avebury or Stonehenge, it, they are exceptional in that way. Um, other heritage landscapes, you wouldn't necessarily have pathways marked out in that kind of way. Um, 
so you probably wouldn't get the same depth of exp- or the same impact. But I, I imagine it's the same for for different time periods. And, you know, even just uh, walking along field boundaries, um, things like that, that a Roman road, whatever it is, that it's it's going to affect people. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Is that is that really answered your question or? Oh yes, yes. It's I just wanted more more examples like you 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 did, and maybe uh, we could consider walking into the heritage as a uh, as a way to answer your your final questions and how can we uh, make a heritage interpretation more uh, mindful. Okay. The, the challenge is that. how to do that uh, where the conditions are different are different yeah yeah I know what you mean and and there are loads of other projects so um, one project that happened at the same time as the one I did uh, was also carried out in uh, Stonehenge and Avebury which is the Human Henge project and they've done amazing work with uh, people with mental health issues walking in the landscape and they talk about walking with intent um, so that it might be worth your while looking at those they've quite a lot of um, publications out as well um, uh, I think actually there might be other, there's a book that I referenced earlier called Mental Wellbeing in Historic Landscapes, which has a lot of the human hand work in there, but also has work from other projects. And I think there may be um, something that could help there in relation to different per- time periods. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the reference you are mentioning now, Claire, is on the website of Uniscape because you have the bibliography and it's in there. That's so right. Yeah. You can, uh, can look them up. So um, uh, thank you, Margarita, also for not only for the question, but in this way, you introduced yourself in a way already, because you're the speaker for the next uh, session, which is nice to have you here already. <laughs> thank you. And then I think there is one last uh, question from uh, Cassandra. I don't know if you're still there. Um, it's also a very long one. So maybe you can um, um, yeah, just uh, put on your microphone and, and tell it that's easier to understand. Yes, um, can, I'm here, yes. can you hear me? Yes, okay, welcome. Um, I, did, I thought that was really interesting, um, the idea of walking in the landscape. And I'm um, at the beginning of a PhD research project on the caretakers of uh, historic gardens. And uh, I have a personal connection as well because my partner is the curator of a botanical garden. And I, so, I know that he, um, if I, you know, he's, he, his, his job is very stressful. It's not, he doesn't perceive all of the well being benefits that visitors do uh, because he cares so deeply um, for uh, his garden. I think this is, is common um, among people who who work in this kind of profession, they're constantly managing a series of demands um, that are both physical and psychological. And uh, and so I'm interested in in investigating how how much weight can we ask them to carry, both in terms of the care for the garden itself and their own own personal well-being. Um, and mm-hmm. so uh, I was wondering, you know, one of the comments that you mentioned got into that a little bit with the woman who had a special piece of land. And I was wondering if you had other insight on uh, people who aren't visiting, but who are managing these spaces. Mm. I'm not so much because I focus mainly on um, on sort of public opinions and, mm-hmm. and uh, visitors and locals, but um, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier i think i think there's room for where this kind of mindful um experiential practice is 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 coming into a lot of disciplines now Mm -hmm. um and especially for public engagement but i'm really wondering if there's some way we can bring it into management into landscape planning um and it might sound a bit flaky and airy fairy and uh you know but actually i think there's a lot of value in it because i, c- I think it would connect well with things like conflict resolution mm-hmm. which uh, again baz mentioned last month that this is landscape can divide as well as bring people together and it's kind of landscape or a c- conflict resolution should be fundamental to how we manage them um if we can if we can be more reflective with each other if maybe heritage professionals can sit with planners can see, you know different people sitting around together talking about these things in a deeper deeper way maybe we can manage 
personal well-being of of the people who work in heritage mm -hmm. but also manage uh the issues uh, the ethical issues that come up around we'll say how a piece of land or how, how a monument makes someone's life mm -hmm. uh uh, you know, hell because they can't do anything with that piece of land or mm. um, or you know things like the Stonehenge debate about roads and not having roads and how do we work together and this is where I think you know I suppose it's actually the most important thing I want to say really is um, how uh, the Cherryscape project that uh, Graham Fairclough was involved with talks about how landscape is it's all uh, of course it's, pr it's privately owned it's public owned there's it's but it, we still share it. We still mm -hmm. share landscape, even if we don't own it all, <laughs> um, you know, and we need to start working together as private owners, as public, mm -hmm. as you know, to, to manage these spaces better and to listen to each other, to understand each other's perspective and to remember that we are doing, we should be doing this together. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that would take the, the load off of the people who are taking care of these spaces, because although we, you know, we share them, there's, specific people who are taking care of them and the public tend to underestimate how much um, how much money and effort is involved in the care of a heritage landscape. I think um, one of the big stressors, it would be interesting to do a study looking into this, is that feeling that it's never enough. There are never enough hours in the day, there's never enough money, and there's never uh, enough time. Um, mm. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Yeah, there's, so there's a lot it, of work. There. These kinds of embodied experiences with visitors make them at least a little bit more uh, participants in that landscape. Um, and maybe that, that can bring the two groups of people uh, closer together and make, make the managers less invisible. Mm, but that, hopefully that would be <laughs> ideal. <laughs> it's worth a shot, I reckon. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Lots to think about. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Cassandra, also for your uh, input. And I think um, we. I see that there is no other question. So maybe it's also time to to. Vale, maybe yes. maybe there is another question from Nuala. Ah, did I miss? You raised the hand before. Nuala, me flat. Then I I missed it somewhere somehow. I don't know if you if yeah. you there. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah, I, I just, uh, I just put a little question in the chat there. I wasn't sure about the procedure. So, um, is there time? Yes, yes, yeah. you can have the last question then. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, yeah, this is really just following on from Cassandra's question, and um, yeah, thank you for a really interesting talk, Claire. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of interested. My, my research is based in in the Gaeltacht and I'm, I'm looking at uh, how um, narratives about the Gaeltacht impact uh, visual art that comes out of the area. Um, mm. One of the things I was looking at is this idea of timelessness. So this kind of constructive, constructed narrative of an area that is timeless or somehow out of time. And so tourists, when they come to a, to a heritage site or a heritage area, expect you know this is this is what they expect and this is what they want to experience to a huge degree mm. um and again i think this is very kind of related to cassandra's question um so how to negotiate the the, the two sides of it so if you if you over push this romantic image that you need to to pull tourists in but then the knock-on effects for that for the for the local area and for culture that's produced in the area. Um, mm. so yeah, very... I was just wondering if you have any comments about that. Ooh, yeah, no, that's a brilliant question because I think as well, um, the narrative that we've created with heritage sites, it's already well established now in, you know, in our kind of cultural consciousness. And um, so to change that is an even bigger challenge. Um, uh, I think, again, going back to the idea of questioning and and sort of neutral questioning. Now, I tried and, you know, I'll be honest, my 
my um, methodology was ex experimental and certainly could be done a whole lot better if somebody came along and did it again. I'm sure it could be improved, but it was um, a stab at trying to ask neutral questions about experience and um, to get to kind of get beneath the intellectual understanding of a place in, in terms of what people come with in, in terms of their heritage consciousness, their existing common knowledge of something. Um, so I think, I think it's back to just getting people to question that, you know, basic neutral questions. What are you experiencing? And, uh, and how do we, if we can build that into our, um, our heritage sites in terms of the uh, presentation and the exhibitions that we have, not always feeding information to people, but um, asking questions first of their experience and maybe then giving an interpretation later. Um, but I did notice, so when I brought people to um, Avebury, I didn't talk about any, I didn't interpret it, unless people ask me questions about specific things, about dates of certain things. I didn't go into any kind of grand narrative about the site. I just left it to the participants to experience it. And some of those people were who were living locally hadn't actually been to the site before. Um, and they didn't really know a whole lot about it. And they kind of didn't, they weren't expecting a whole lot. And by the end of it, um, had thought about these bigger things like timelessness and just, I think going back to what Connor said about the, the, the sheer scale of these places, um, just started to get people to think differently. And also this idea of walking around in a circle when you're inside a stone circle, it, it sort of sent people off into this timeless zone, which I had never experienced. I mean, that's the other thing. A lot of things I heard back from people, I'd never even thought about myself or experienced. So it was surprising to me. Um, so I'm not saying I, I achieved you know, got people to get out of their common knowledge of, of a site. But I, um, I'm, I think I might have at least got closer to some other experience that isn't uh, defined by how we present these places. Um, one, so one I, thing, yeah, I don't... Sorry, Claire. One thing I was thinking of when you, was um, the henge at Ackle, you know, the henge that's newly built in Ackle. Um, oh, and I how, that. oh, yeah. So, so <laughs> some some business person just decided to to build one. I think maybe around ten years ago, uh, and it's huge, it's ginormous, and people go there. I mean, <laughs> and it's um, it's kind of acquired. It's acquired a similar aura to right to other to 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 old henges or you know prehistoric henges. Um, so, so it's just interesting in terms of what uh, the shape itself can trigger and people's expectations, you know, of, uh, you know, I am now in a henge and, um, yeah. and I will experience certain things. Um, but Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a separate space. I mean, you could have a, it could be a church that you go into and you get a similar response to it as well. It's this, it's a, a space that's been set apart. So immediately we, go into a different way of thinking yeah um but actually going back to what you're saying about newer monuments um Kenny Brophy I don't know if he's here today but he's uh, an archaeologist from Scotland and he's done a lot of work on um new versions of ancient monuments in landscape and how people respond to that thank you very much Kenny. thank you all um, I have the feeling that we maybe could continue uh, for a long time, but I see at least where I'm living now, it's seven o'clock in the evening. So maybe it's <laughs> time to close um, the session officially. Um, first of all, I really would like to thank Claire and uh, Shabna for their, uh, um, the presentation and the respondent, because I think it was a, a kind of eye opener probably for a lot of people. So thank you very much for this. I also think you clearly showed, Claire, um, that uh, landscape is a place where the disciplines meet, but I think also based in the different discussions, I think it's anyhow also a place where, landscape, where people are meeting. So that's uh, at least also core in, in what we are doing in a way. So thanks mm -hmm. to, the, to uh, you two, also to Connor. I think he left already, but he's kind of the, the man behind the scenes today who did a lot of uh, the preparatory work. And also to Tommaso, uh, who took care of the technical aspects uh, of today. I suppose that Tommaso is still there. So um, 
thank you all and Tessa also. Um, and as I told you uh, before, the next um, the next uh, session is by uh, Margarita. Uh, I just have to see Cassini on the 2nd of March and she will talk about landscape and the new mobility paradigm. So um, that also might explain the questions of the walk that, uh, that she had. So we are very much looking forward to the next uh, session and uh, I wish you all a, a happy or a good evening or day wherever you are. So uh, enjoy the rest of the day.